from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for coming. We're really delighted to have you here in the African Middle East Division. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, I'm the chief of the division, and I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I always begin with a little statement about our division, uh, about what it does, and uh, it's how it's composed, and who the people are, etc. So I'll do it. This, uh, this event is being uh, webcast, which means that eventually, if you want to let your friends know about it, those who could not come, they'll be able to watch it on the library's website. So the African Middle East Division is made up of three sections. The African section, uh, the Near East section, and the Hebraic section. And we cover together 78 countries of the world, and we collect in the vernacular. We collect in the languages of the countries. And we are custodians of those collections, which come from, uh, for the Hebraic section, from all over the world, for the African section, also from many parts of the world. But we have an office in Nairobi. For the Arab world, we have an office in Cairo. We also have uh, an office in Islamabad. And those offices collect the materials, catalog the materials, and then send them to the library. We are the only library in the world that does that. And so we're very fortunate to be able to collect these materials. Uh, the division does not only collect materials and catalog them and have them shelved and serve them in the reading room, but it also uh, creates uh, exhibits with some of those materials to display them, uh, invites speakers, as we have, as we are doing today, uh, to speak on uh, regions that we cover. Uh, we also uh, go to conferences, participate uh, in conferences. We have smaller display. We do briefings for government officials, uh, many of whom come again via the State Department uh, through the visitors program, they come to the, to the library uh, to be briefed very often about their own collections. I mean, just now, we just had the Kyrgyz uh, delegation who was uh, made up of young parliamentarians who were here, and they were delighted to see that we were collecting in their language uh, materials, serials, books, um, and other publications uh, here. And so, uh, and then we have, of course, the specialists. And the specialists in, uh, in this division, as they are in many other divisions of the library, are themselves scholars. Uh, they have published, they have written, they participate in conferences, uh, and uh, they know the cultures, they know the languages of many of the countries that we cover. So each is each member of the staff is a treasure in and of himself or herself because they bring so much to, uh, to the collections. Without the people, it would be very difficult to assist those who come, our patrons, our researchers who come here. And so without further ado, I would like to uh, invite one of our scholars, one of our specialists, Laverne Page, uh, who will introduce the program and the speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. And again, my name is Laverne Page. I'm one of four librarians in the African section in this division. In this unit of the library, we offer a variety of noontime programs on so many different subjects, and they relate in some way to the collections on Africa that have been acquired over decades and, and decades. So today's program is a book talk by someone who I, whom I am very privileged to introduce to you, Ambassador Herman J. Cohen. 
Our speaker today, Ambassador Herman J. Cohen, is the author of The Mind of the African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen, and Father Figures. As an ambassador, advisor to presidents, and a 38-year veteran of the Foreign Service, Ambassador Cohen has known every first-generation African leader. During his tenure as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs during the first Bush administration and through his role at the National Security Council in the Reagan administration, Ambassador Cohen worked to bring about peaceful transitions of power in South Africa and Namibia and helped to end conflicts in Angola, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. His curriculum vitae is extensive. Currently, he is president and CEO of Cohen and Woods International. He serves on the board of directors of Hyperdynamics Oil and Gas and serves as a consultant on Africa for Contour Global Electric Power. His background previously held positions um, from start to finish, I'll, I'll uh, no, I meant to say, um, I would start from the earliest um, and then come to the most current. So he was chief of mission in Kinshasa in the DRC from 1968 to uh, 1969, director for Central African Affairs at the State Department, 1969 to 1974, U.S. Ambassador to Senegal and Gambia, 1977 to 1980, Principal Deputy Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research, 1980 to 1984. And I should say, we received a lot of publications here at the library from INRP um, during that, that period. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for Africa National Security Council, 1987 to 1989, assistant secretary of state for Africa, 1989 to 1993, senior advisor, Global Coalition for Africa, 1993 to 1998, and from 1998 to 2010, he was a professional lecturer in African Studies at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He has received many awards, and I won't read them, but I will just point out that one of the many awards that he received um, was the Douglas Dillon Award for Best Writing on Diplomatic Practice, and he received this in, 20, in the year 2000. And so today, we will have the opportunity to experience firsthand um, his diplomatic account. So thank you very much. Ambassador Cohen. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for coming on this uh, very wet day. And as you can tell from the uh, introduction, I'm a, at an advanced age. <laughs> uh, uh, I just want to note about President Reagan. Uh, I worked for him for two years and he was a very curious guy. Uh, you know, I would be sitting in my office and i get a call. President Reagan wants a briefing on Mozambique. Can you come Thursday morning at 9 o'clock? He, he really liked to ask questions about places. He, he just didn't uh, sit in his office and uh, wait for people. Uh, why did I write this book? Well, one thing, the US, being a US diplomat in Africa gives you a lot of access. The African leaders tend to like to deal with Americans. You know, we had no colonial history so we didn't have that mark against us. And we had, a, we had a tendency, even from the early days of independence, to be very enthusiastic about independence. And we, gave, we brought in a lot of technical assistance, a lot of foreign aid and that sort of thing. And we had some presidents like John F. Kennedy uh, who were very interested in Africa and showed it. So it was very friendly. So we had a lot of access. So because of that, I was able to meet a lot of these first and second generation heads of state and the reason I wanted to write about them was that they made the basic decisions after independence that really set the pattern of how Africa would react to the rest of the world and how they would engage in economic development. And I think it tells the story right out of their, out of their lips if you, if you read the book. Okay, so 
right after independence, which took place between 1956 and 1963 or four, uh, we as junior diplomats who had opted to go to Africa, we had very strict instructions. Do not tell them what to do. You know, they've just become independent. They want to make their own decisions. So don't start giving them a lot of advice unless they ask for it, you see. Okay, so they came into power and they had to make some basic decisions. What kind of government are we going to have? Well, on the economic side, it was a time in the early 60s when the Europeans were very socialist. You know, they had the Second World War, they had the Great Depression before that, and they said, maybe let's give socialism a chance. So these African leaders went to their friends in the, in the UK and France and said, what do you recommend on economic policy? And these who were mainly socialist party people said, for you trying to move quickly into economic development, nationalize everything. All the major enterprises should be government owned. Banks, insurance company, plantations, small industry, transportation, just take it all over and then move ahead quickly with development. And that's what they did. They just, and they also did it correctly. They paid the owners. And the owners took their money and just left quietly. So it was all done quite correctly and, and uh, democratically. Now, on the political side, they inherited the type of governments that, of their colonial powers, especially the UK and France, which was two-house parliament, multi-party elections, and that sort of thing. So after they went through one round of uh, Western-style democracy, they started to get frustrated. They said, this is not African. Look at these British and French parliaments. All they do all day is shout at each other, and they insult each other. Africans don't like to do that. You know, we, we like consensus. You know, in the old days in the village, if there was a big problem, the, the village chief would gather everyone around the baobab tree, if you're in that one of those countries, and we talk and talk and talk, maybe after a couple of days, we suddenly come with consensus, and there's no shouting and yelling or insulting. We do it all in a very quiet, friendly way. So how do, how do we change our political system? Well, they decided that there would not be political parties. They would have a single party to which all citizens would belong, and to which all institutions would belong, like the media, like civil society. You know, you had a bar association or women's groups or youth groups. They would all be part of this single party. They called it the African one-party state. And many of the African countries incorporated that in their constitutions. This will be a one-party state, and the party will be the Kenya African National Union. Each one had their own liberation party. Okay, so with this economic policy and political policy, this is the way they launched their newly independent states in Africa. Well, these decisions done by the founding fathers, whom I write about in the book, they had very, <clears throat> excuse me, they had very important consequences. On the economic side, okay, so you, you take over all of these enterprises and they make them government owned, well, you have to run them, right? You have to run them in order to make profits, to reinvest, to expand, and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, most of the African governments didn't do that because there was a tremendous demand from the rural areas for jobs. So what they did is they opened up all of these enterprises and filled them with people looking for jobs. And they, they overloaded the system. There were too many people. And after a while, most of these enterprises started to become, started to lose money. Uh, just to give you one example, my first African post was Uganda, which is on the east, east side, right next to Kenya. And you can see on the map near the horn there. And they had an airline called Uganda Airlines. They had three planes, and it was a very good airline. You can go all over the region. You can go to Nairobi, you can go to uh, Tanzania, Zanzibar. It was a very well-run airline. But for three planes, after, after they nationalized it, it had 5,000 employees. Now, you don't need 5,000 employees to run an airline with three planes. So this was happening all over these countries that are nationalized. They had too many people. 
Okay, so what happens when you have too many people and you're losing money? You have to subsidize and you, get, you have to get the money from someplace else, right? So it comes out of health care, comes out of infrastructure, comes out of maintenance, port structures and that sort of thing. So they developed something like a, a vicious cycle which the more money that they took away from services to run these enterprises, the more services deteriorated and people who still own businesses, especially the small ones, they were having a harder and harder time to, to make do. Because if you don't have electricity 24 hours, if you don't have water, if you don't have a road to the port, things go badly. So the, the economies of many of these countries started to go backwards. Now on the political side, what happens when you have only one system with no what we call countervailing power? Who's gonna criticize things if they don't like it or if things are going wrong? Well, you don't do that. You all belong to the same party, and everybody follows the party line. Uh, there's no media that doesn't belong to the party. In all, most of my uh, embassies where I worked in Africa, there was only one newspaper. That was the, that was the state-run newspaper. It changed much later. So there was nobody to tell power, hey, things are going wrong here. We better try to change. And, but some people who were brave enough to start talking, they were, they were put in prison. It became more and more authoritarian. And the, the single party became more and more of a state within a state. It became a career thing. People joined the party and this is my career. And this, is, and this party started to siphon off money that was in the treasury that should have been used for other things. So the one-party state became more and more authoritarian and, and the governance of the country deteriorated. On the economic side, you had a lot of enterprises losing money, therefore the economy was going backwards. There was one thing that helped the Africans though between the independence period and around 1978. That was what they were selling to the world, agricultural and mineral commodities, had very high prices. So they were making a lot of money selling these things like palm oil and copper and, and columbite and tantalum and that sort of thing. So this tended to cover some of the difficulties on the economic side. And also, having good prices for commodities allowed them to borrow money on international markets. They would go to Citibank or some banks in London and say, look, we're producing 800,000 tons of copper a year at a dollar fifty a pound. Lend us money on, on the money we're gonna earn next year. And the banks were quite happy to do that. In fact, there was Citibank, uh, the president of Citibank had a press conference, or one of his quarterly stockholders conference, and they said, aren't you a little frightened about lending money to, to a lot of these African governments? And he said, governments, sovereign governments do not go bankrupt. Well, he, he had some lessons to learn a little later. Okay, now in 1978, around between 1978 and 1990, uh, 1980, the market fell for most of these commodities. There were other producers coming on stream, like Malaysia, Brazil, and they were undercutting the prices for Africa. So by the time we get to 1979, 1980, a lot of these African countries were in real difficulty. They owed a lot of money, and the money they were getting for their commodities were way down. So they were real difficulty. But the United States, as I remember being instructed as a diplomat, no criticism, no finger pointing. They're making their own decisions, okay? Just leave them alone. But when it came to around 1980, they were in real difficulty. So we had to find a bad cop who could tell them, you know, you, you gotta straighten up. And who do you think the bad cop was? Any idea? It was the World Bank. The World Bank, I remember I was U.S. ambassador in Senegal, which is on the west coast here, all the way on the bulge. And all of a sudden I saw the restaurants and the bars with strange faces, you know, Asians, people from, from South Asia, from Latin America. And I would say, what are you doing here? And they say, we're going to straighten this country out. <laughs> and that's what they try to do. And they said to these governments who were really deeply in debt, couldn't pay off their debts. You know, it's like what you see on television sometime. 
is your credit card debt much too high? Are you having problems? Just call this 800 number and we'll fix it up. Well, it was the same thing with the World Bank. They said, look, we'll take over your debts and you'll, you'll have to reimburse us, but it'll be only 1% interest. And you'll have a 10-year grace period. That's free money. That's, ter that's terrific. So they all signed. They all signed. But they had some conditions. And the conditions were a whole list of economic reforms that they had to undertake. Get rid of loss-making enterprises, or at least make them profit-making by lowering the population employed. Change your exchange rates so that imports are more expensive and exports are cheaper. There's a whole list of things that they had to do, but they all signed. And they all went through these reform periods. So by the time we reach uh, 1995, most of these African governments, which were really going downhill, had revived. And they were doing 3 to 4% growth every year. Now, that's not enough for becoming a really sustainable economic development, but they were doing, they were keeping afloat. They were keeping afloat. So the World Bank had done a very good job. <clears throat> uh, and on the political side, as more and more Africans came back from universities, many of them had gone abroad, many of them had studied in their own countries, more and more of them were saying, this single party system is not working. It's authoritarian. No new ideas are being allowed. If we really want to move ahead, we have to get some debate going. And, and the only way to do that is have multi parties so that they can, and also free press. So but I would say between 1985 and 1995, most African governments changed their political systems to allow multi parties, to allow free media. So when I started out in Uganda, I only saw one newspaper, there was only one TV station. By the time I left in my last post in Senegal, there were many TV stations, privately owned, media privately owned, uh, civil society was flourishing. So things really were, were shaken up and there was a lot of fresh ideas floating around and uh, things, things were moving ahead. Uh, now, U.S. policy at the time started to change also. We were thinking mainly of foreign aid, giving aid to the government so they can invest in, in infrastructure or education or health. We started to think, well, maybe, maybe we ought to change as well. And we started to, President uh, George H.W. Bush, he was the first president to say, let's spend money on promoting democracy in Africa. And I was assistant secretary for him. And we started spending money promoting democracy, multi-party systems, teaching parliamentarians how to be independent parliamentarians. And also, George H.W. Bush started to promote private sector investments. This is something we had never done. You know, we said foreign aid will do it. We'll give money to the governments and let them spend on, uh, on development. But we reached the conclusion that if people are not investing to start businesses, start production facilities, then they're really not going to move ahead. So we started promoting that. And the way we did it was to say, you need the environment so that your own people will invest money. We saw a lot of Africans who were making money in various ways, putting their money outside Africa and keeping it there because they didn't have confidence that if they invested, they would be able to, their investments would be safe. So we started promoting investments, uh, setting up a system where you can have the rule of law, where your contracts could be adjudicated correctly so that you feel that you, you didn't, your money was not going to be lost through nefarious practices. And that, this was our policy. Then President Clinton came in and he started something new. He started the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which was Whatever you make in Africa, you could sell to the United States duty-free. This was a, a law passed by Congress called the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. And this told the Africans, if you make it, we'll take it, which was a great advantage. Because if you made a lady's sweater, let's say, in, uh, 
in South Africa, you could sell it more cheaply to the United States than something made in Hong Kong because the Hong Kong sweater had to pay duty. So more and more investors were going into Africa to start these facilities. I would say the African Growth and Opportunity Act created something like three million jobs in Africa. Still not enough for real big development, but it was, it was a good start. And I would say that the most creative policy of the United States came under George W. Bush. His first of all, he started a major, po uh, a major program to end HIV in Africa. HIV was really in epidemic proportions in Africa. And it was a major program to help treat people, help prevent people from getting it. Secondly, he started the, what is called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which rates countries based on various criteria, rated by outside people, not by the American State Department, but now the World Bank, Freedom House, and various others. Now, which of the countries that are making the greatest effort to really achieve a sustainable development? And the ones at the top of the list would get major inputs of resources, and we would negotiate them with them, how do you spend that money? You see. Uh, so this has been running now since uh, George W. Bush, and it's, it's been doing a lot of good, good stuff. For example, in the country of Benin, who's down on the, on the bulge there on West Africa, they've just re redone their entire port system. And uh, Ethiopia has, has used that to really fix up its infrastructure. So this, is, this has been a very constructive, constructive program. And President Obama has, uh, in my view, really done some very good work in a couple of ways. First, as a, as a son of an African, he felt that he could speak the truth to power in Africa, unlike all previous US presidents who said, they're independent, let them make their own decisions, we're not going to criticize, we'll be helpful where we can, but we're not gonna point any fingers at Africa. President Obama has pointed fingers. He says there's too much corruption, uh, there's too much authoritarianism, uh, you need better governance, we're here to help you, but you'll not achieve development unless you pull up your own socks. You see. If you allow people to invest money and keep it safe, Africans will invest money. We can't do that for you. And he he keeps saying development comes from within. And he's been very blunt uh, with the Africans. I've been in some of his meetings with African heads of state representing the business community here who, who, who invests in Africa. And he's been very blunt, but he's also had some, some very good programs. For example, he has a program called Feed the Future. The idea is that Africa needs to develop agriculture so that they don't have to import their own food. You know, most of the money that they make on commodities, and by the way, they had a second commodities boom between the year 2000 and the year 2012 because China was buying so much. This has ended now, and they, they have not taken advantage of all the money they made to really diversify and start production facilities. So uh, what Ob Obama is, is saying, your agriculture is very primitive. And unless you modernize it, you're not going to be able to get anywhere because you're spending all of your money that you're making on commodities to buy food, to import food. So this uh, program, Feed the Future, is bringing modern technology to the African farmer. Better seeds, better storage, better farm-to-market roads, and better communications with the markets. And th this is starting to take hold in a number of countries. For example, Nigeria which is also on the south of the bulge there, is the, has the country with the largest population in Africa. They are now the biggest producer of cassava or manioc in the world. And this is a product that's widely used not only for food but for industry. And more and more African countries are starting to reach their potential in agriculture thanks to U.S. inputs. And the other thing that Obama has done is to start a program called Power Africa. 
only about 30% of Africans have access to electric power. This is much too low, because you really can't build a factory or do anything economic without steady, reliable power. So what President Obama is doing is encouraging U.S. companies to build power plants in Africa and to sell, sell the power. Now, up until about 10 years ago, the Africans were building their own power plants. And of course, with their economic problems, they weren't able to build sufficient amounts and they weren't able to maintain them. So what the investors do, and I'm working with a company called Contro Global, is invest in power and then sell power under long-term contracts, which means that the African governments don't have to borrow money to build power plants. And this is, and because President Obama is in favor of it, U.S. agencies are also helping, like Export Import Bank, uh, OPEC, are providing cheap financing, low-cost financing, and more and more power is being built in Africa, and that's, there's still a long way to go. So generally speaking, uh, the people I wrote about in my book were the ones who made these early decisions, nationalize everything, have an authoritarian one-party state. If you read the book, you can see the great dichotomy between the United States and these early leaders. Here we were, enthusiastic about independence. We're coming in to help you develop. But they had other priorities. Their priorities were how do we maintain our independence? How do we stay in power? How do we take care of our tribes? They really didn't think economic development. It took them a long time before they reached that. Now you have the third and fourth generation in power. People have been to universities, have taken courses. For example, the president of Togo, which is a very little country on the south end of the bulge, he has a master's, he has an MBA for George Washington University. And he's doing all sorts of good stuff in his little country. And more and more of the third and fourth generation are, are coming with these, with these modern ideas. So overall, I'm kind of optimistic. It's still a long way to go. There are still a lot of countries where being an independent businessman is seen as a threat to power, and that has to change. And there's not enough support given to the rural areas. And uh, so some countries are still in the doldrums, but more and more countries like Kenya, uh, Nigeria, uh, Botswana, they're, they're starting to move ahead uh, slowly. And I think in, within the next 10 years, we're going to have about a dozen African countries, which will be the equivalent of the Southeast Asian tigers, like Malaysia and South Korea. And I think it's worth U.S. policy to, to continue pushing all of these reforms and this technical assistance. I'll stop now and see if you have any questions. Or comments. Yes. Yeah, well, the, the, the question is, uh, the encouragement of uh, energy development, is there a specific area where this is being done? Well, we're working with all African countries, and secondly, we're encouraging U.S. companies to go and negotiate deals. Uh, the company I am with, Contra Global, we now have five power plants in Africa, and we've signed long-term power purchase agreements uh, with these countries. And we sell to the utilities, and they redistribute the electric power to consumers, you see. So we have power plants using uh, gas, using heavy fuel oil. Uh, we have solar. Uh, and one very, very innovative power plant is in the country called Rwanda uh, on Lake Kivu, which is in the very center uh, of Africa. Lake Kivu is a very deep lake. It's, it's about uh, 1,500 feet deep. And there's methane gas seeping through the bottom of the lake, and it ends up in suspension about 500 feet down from the surface. And it keeps accumulating and accumulating. 
And there are a couple of lakes like that in Africa, but every 500 years, these lakes explode and kill lots of people and livestock. So what this company is doing, they've figured out a technology to extract this methane gas from the middle of the lake. You can't just put a pipe in there and suck it out. It's a special technology. It took them a year to develop. And they take it out and bring it to the land, and they, they burn it to make electricity. So it has dual purpose. It brings power, and it saves people from getting a, getting a big explosion. <laughs> so it's very, to answer your question, it's, very, it's varied, all types. In Ethiopia, right now there's a U.S. company doing what they call geothermal, where there's heat deep in the ground, and you can tap that. Uh, the country that's really used geothermal a great deal is Iceland. They heat and have power from, from this geothermal. So, we, so the idea is bring the power as best way you can. Just do it instead of worrying about how you do it. Uh, any other? Yes. <coughs> Uh, the question is, what are the Chinese policies in Africa, and does it help the countries there? China is very heavily involved in Africa, uh, and there's been stages of why they've been uh, involved. But since the year 2000, China has been very hungry for commodity inputs for their vast economic expansion. So anything that Africa could produce China was buying. China was buying oil. There's a lot of oil produced in Africa, copper, all sorts of minerals. And so the, the way the Chinese did this, they would go to a country and say, you have infrastructure needs. You need roads. You need dams. You need airports. Uh, let's make a deal. We will, we will do the construction work for you based on your priorities. And we will lend you the money, soft loans, from one of our big insurance companies. In return, we would like a guarantee of certain commodities on a regular basis. For example, if you can guarantee us 200,000 barrels a day of oil, that'll be the reciprocity for our work and infrastructure. And we're going to pay for the oil. We don't want a gift. We'll pay at regular world prices. So China has done this all over Africa. And it's kind of like a barter deal. You know, we, we get the commodities, you get the construction work. And they've done this in many, many African countries. Now, I have never heard any American official say, this is against US interests. They say, well, it's helping Africa develop, getting more infrastructure, that's good. But what I tell my African friends is, you have to manage this a lot better. Because what do the Chinese do? They tried to bring in their own workers, you know, I mean the lowest level workers, uh, rather than hire Africans. So that, that's a negative factor. Secondly, when they hire Africans, they don't treat them well. I, I had a student at Johns Hopkins who spent the summer studying China in Africa, and I asked her to give a talk to the class, and she said, well, I went to these Chinese mine owner, he, was, he owned a copper mine, and I looked around, and I saw it was very bad conditions for the African workers. So I asked him, well, why can't you improve things a little bit? And he said, well, we're treating them just like we treat our own Chinese workers. <laughs> so that, that was a negative factor. And another thing is they don't develop management. If you go to an American oil company in Africa, you'll see very senior management people who are Africans. For example, if you go to Chevron, you know, one of the big ones in Nigeria, and say, I'd like to meet the CEO here, and you go in, it's a Nigerian. Now, he's, he was not selected because he had political connections. He's been with Chevron for 35 years. He's served in Kazakhstan and Canada, various other places. He's a, he's a, a pro in, in oils. But the Chinese tend not to develop uh, not to develop uh, senior management. And the final downside is when they send a Chinese company to do work, they bid it out to their state-owned companies in China. And not every company is as good as all the others. So sometimes you'll get a company that doesn't do the best work. 
and I know uh, several U.S. construction companies now that are getting work to repair what the Chinese have done, you know, especially airport runways. So in general, China is contributing to African development in general. Now, the, as you've read in the paper, the Chinese economic boom has slowed down. Therefore, they're buying less from Africa. And therefore, Africa is now earning a lot less money. And they made the mistake of not using that 10-year boom to diversify, to develop their own production facilities. They just stayed with, they just stayed with earning money from commodities. They didn't do anything for infrastructure or for agricultural development. So, the, so a, lot of, a lot of African countries are now suffering uh, from the deep fall in the commodity prices. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if, if you didn't hear the question, it's, uh, is Africa diversifying its agriculture? So instead of relying solely on cash crops, which will be sold abroad, are they doing things to make sure they become self-sufficient in food? This is a very important, and it's one of the reasons that President Obama started his Feed the Future program. Uh, Africa's arable land that is still not cultivated equals 45% of the land surface of the United States. It's a tremendous amount of land. And with irrigation and then other types of inputs, they could do a tremendous job, not only of producing their own food, but of exporting a lot of food to other places, including China. Uh, and really, they're still quite behind in, in, attacking, in attacking this issue. Uh, there's always been a tendency for Africans to favor the urban areas. And that's why so many people are moving into the urban areas, because that's where you can get some services. And the rural areas have been neglected. So if they can get some more irrigation in there and better land tenure, a uh, land tenure is another problem. In so many African countries, a farmer cannot own the land. Now, if you cannot own the land, you can't borrow against it and improve your facilities. So there's a lot of hard work to be done, and I'm, that's why I'm so happy that President Obama has made farming and imp improved technology for farming one of his highest priorities for Africa. And some countries are moving ahead, especially Nigeria. I really have a lot of faith in Nigeria, which is, has the biggest population. Kenya is doing very well. South Africa has always been very self-sufficient in agriculture, and they're getting better. But we need more and more countries to use that arable land that's not being used. But also, uh, the world population is expected to rise from 7 billion to 9 billion by 2050. And Africans' unused arable land is going to be vital uh, to feed all of those people. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. The question is, we have, still have strong men in Africa who have not adopted democracy or not even moving close to democracy, very authoritarian, uh, not nice people, but are we able to work with these people in order to achieve other objectives like agriculture and what have you? It reminds me when I was a very junior person in, uh, in Congo. You know, it's that big country right in the middle. It's now the biggest country in Africa since Sudan was split up. Uh, and I was there, and they had a 
a strongman president named Mobutu. I write a whole chapter about him in the book. And I, I, was, I ran into the French ambassador, who was very senior. He came from a distinguished family, Casiasco Morizé. His granddaughter is now running for president in France. So I said to him, Mr. Ambassador, how can we work with this guy? He's so corrupt and he doesn't do anything for the people and what have you. He said, let me tell you, young man, in our business, we work with what exists. So we're working with what exists, with the president of Chad and all that. And our highest priority is security, right? Our highest priority is anti-terrorism. And uh, the fact that uh, some tribes get left out, they don't get any money or any resources, we got to say, well, we'll take care of that later. We'll work on that later, you see, and their priorities. But my view is you work with everybody. I do not believe in boycotting people. I would have an ambassador in Tehran. I would have ambassadors all over the place. Uh, I was very sorry we didn't have an embassy in Libya for so many years. You see. You've got to work with what exists. Any other comments? I've exhausted you. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. Yeah, the question is, uh, is Africa is, is trying to get unified? Is there a strategy to work sort of on the entire continent rather than region by region or country by country? I think there is. <clears throat> One thing I didn't mention on the economic side, the Africans can make so much money if they traded with each other. You know, you have a billion people in Africa, tremendous market, but yet only... 10% of their trade is with each other. You know, if they built factories, they would have tremendous markets that could defeat China or anyone else because it's right there, right next door to them. And they've had a problem with internal trade in Africa. It's hard to cross the border because somebody's always looking to make money from stuff crossing the border. There are a number of African regions which theoretically have open borders. For example, all of the French-speaking countries, uh, the former French colonies, they have the same currency. So it should be easy. You can sell next door and don't have to change your money. But it's, it's very hard, and they have no tariffs, but it's very hard, apparently, to cross the border. There's always somebody at the border trying to do things to make it harder for you to sell in the neighboring country. So we're encouraging the Africans <clears throat> to have regional integration open the borders, just, and then, so, if you have a market, a potential market of 50 million people, it's worthwhile to build a factory. But if it's only 10 million people in a small country, it's not worth it, you see. So, you make a very good point. We need to get the Africans to work more and more together and make money from each other. And they're not doing that now. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the question is about Cameroon, which is, you can see that toward the west, just bordering with Nigeria. It's in blue on this map. It's fairly what we call the armpit of Africa. And it's, it's always been a very enterprising country. They do a lot of agricultural exports, cocoa, coffee, and they have oil. They have oil. And they have some ethnic groups there, like the Bamaleki, who are very enterprising. They, they set up banks in neighboring countries. Uh, they do uh, transportation. Uh, so it's a very good country. Now, their big problem 
in Cameroon is minority rule. In fact, it's a problem that covers a lot of countries. Let's say the army is controlled mainly by, not controlled, but attracts certain people from certain ethnic groups because they like being in the army. Cameroon, there's an ethnic group that controls power, and it's controlled power for many years, that really represents only about 12% of the population. So a lot of people feel that government is not for them, that they're monopolizing resources. You see. And so there's, it's kind of a sour mood there, except for some of the enterprising tribes like the Bamaleki who don't give a damn who's in power. They're out there making money. You see. But it's ethnically divided among, between Muslims and Christians. They get along very well. Uh, so it could be a great country. It could be a great country, but this minority rule and monopolizing of resources by a small group, this is holding them back, really holding them back. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much. You've been great. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.